Uh, Charlie Munger, who's Warren Buffett's business partner, was a very influential person in, in shaping a lot of my thinking. Yeah. And so, I mean, there's lots of people that have, I mean, that I've stood on the shoulders of, for lack of a better term. Um, and and I mean, like I said, w both people I know and people I don't know that have been massively impactful. I think that your point, Matt, was really good because there's so many people that you don't even know personally that have been those right people for you to get where you are. And, and honestly, like this conversation that you and I are having today is going to send my life in a di different trajectory just because of you sharing your story. And I think people listening to this this episode, they're gonna, they're gonna, they probably will never look back and say Jason Duncan and Matt Bodner were was that person. But we are influencing them, and that's why it's so important to do shows like this and to listen to shows yep. and to listen to your show. I think getting that indirect mentorship, you never who know who that right person is gonna be or when it's gonna happen. In today's ultra-competitive business world, being a successful entrepreneur or business owner can be very challenging. Fortunately, contemporary times have blessed us with resources for tackling those challenges and getting us to success more quickly than we could have imagined. Welcome to the Root of All Success with the real Jason Duncan, a podcast that explores how the world's most powerful entrepreneurs grow incredible companies. This podcast looks at the five keys to unlocking success as an entrepreneur. A successful educator turned entrepreneur, Jason's mission is to use his gifts of teaching and leadership to help others get the results they want out of life. Join Jason every week and learn the keys to grow a truly successful business. Hey there, I'm the real Jason Duncan and welcome back to another episode of The Root of All Success. And I've got a great guest for you today. And I'm interested in talking to this guy. We've been trying to connect for a long time. His name is Matt Bodner. I'll do an introduction officially of him in a minute, but I'm so glad that he's here with me at the Standard Club in Nashville. Uh, if you're not watching this on YouTube, you're missing out. You really got to go look this up, youtube.com slash The Real Jason Duncan. And you can see all the episodes of The Root of All Success right there. We're honored to be syndicated on the C-Suite Radio Network. So we're, thank them for all the places that you can listen to us on every podcast player out there. If you haven't subscribed, it would mean a lot to me if you would go subscribe so that you're notified when new episodes drop. We try to drop two a week. And also, you know, listen, you hear this from every podcast you listen to, but those reviews that all of us podcast hosts ask for really help. And they help because it makes our podcast show up and people's suggestions. And the point of this podcast is to help people just like you and others like you to learn the keys to success as an entrepreneur by hearing stories like Matt's that we're going to hear today about how he did what he did. So by you giving us a review, especially a five-star review, it gets us further up in the rankings so that other people can discover the show. So thank you for doing that. Right now, as of today's recording, all we've got is five-star record, five-star reviews. And I very much appreciate you taking the time to go do that. That's very special to me, so thank you so much. We're here at the Standard Club in Nashville. This is 18,000 square feet of Southern sophistication and style, owned and operated by the one and only Joshua Sterling Smith, who's the proprietor here, a friend of mine, and uh, I'm honored to be a member here at the club, and I'm honored also and thankful that they let me record right here in the Standard. We're in the Rhino Room today. We've actually moved our recordings to a few different rooms to make makeshift studios, and today we're in the Rhino Room, and it's a fantastic room, and it's very comfortable. We're sitting on leather couches and having a good time talking today about success. So today's sponsor, episode sponsor, is 8 Bend Marketing. And the reason I want that they're the sponsor of the show is that as a coach, as a consultant, I've got lots of clients that I work with who need help with their marketing, with their brand messaging, and that's not specifically what I do. So they I either recommend other companies or they go find their own. Well, I've got one particular client in, uh, specifically who came to me, I don't know, it was about a year, year and a half ago, who had just had their messaging work done with a marketing company, and it was fantastic, absolutely phenomenal. And I had to know who it was because it was so on point, so good, so specific, and very clear, which is what I think we need because so many marketing companies don't do a good job of making the messaging clear. So I was really very happy to see what my client had when they came back from working with 8Ben. So I reached out to 8Ben, talked to Josh and the owners, and I said, hey guys, I love what you're doing. 
I, I think more people should, should work with you. So they are the sponsor of today's episode. I've got a special deal worked out with them. They are a story brand company, one of the top story brand marketing companies in the country. If you're familiar with story brand and Donald Miller, they are the top marketing company for story brand in, in the United States. And they are, have a, they have a special for you, for our listeners of the root of all success. Go to the number eight B E N D. That's the number eight B E N D dot marketing. So it's 8ben.marketing slash root, as in root of all success. And they have a special offer for you to go check out how they do what they do so that they can work on your messaging with your small business. We need help with that. Words are important. And just throwing up any words on your website or in your marketing messages isn't enough. You got to get words that convert. And that's what 8ben does. So thank you to Josh and his team down there in Chattanooga. They do a fantastic job. So go to 8ben.marketing slash root for that special offer. All right, that's it for all the introductions and the sponsors. We thank, we're thank we very thankful for our sponsors. They help make the show what it is. I want to introduce our guest today. Matt Bodner has been a guy that uh, w I was introduced through a mutual friend and, and the way that we, I was introduced, like the way I became aware of him, the person that introduced us said, you have got to know this guy. That was what he said. He said, you've got to know this guy's young guy, extremely successful, very, very accomplished in his young life of what he's been able to do as an entrepreneur, working with different companies, helping in mergers and acquisitions. And he's going to talk a little bit about that today. But Matt Bodner uh, was named to the Forbes 30 Under 30 list, which is a huge accomplishment. He uh, has, has been a partner in multiple Inc. 5,000 fastest growing privately held companies in the country. And I know how important and hard it is to get on that list because one of my companies has been on that list a couple of times. So I know that he has worked hard to get on those lists, on that list with his different companies. He's a deal maker, deal maker. he's a strategy expert, and he's scaled multiple businesses across multiple different in industries. He's the chairman of Fresh Technology. He's the co-founder and the managing partner of Fresh Capital and he's the managing partner of Fresh Holdings. And he's been working for a long time, uh, has deep expertise in acquisitions for more than a decade of working with his family office, the Bodner Investment Group. He's also the creator and the host of a podcast that I think you should go check out. And I'm gonna get him to tell a little bit more about this when it's his turn to talk. But uh, it's called the Science of Success Podcast. And when I was introduced to him, I didn't really know that he had that podcast at first. And of course, I have a podcast called The Root of All Success. So he and I, have very similar interests in what we're trying to learn about success. So you're gonna to wanna to go check that out, the Science of Success podcast. It has over five million downloads. He's been doing it for a long time, very successful. Go check it out, the the Science of Success podcast. He's uh, previously worked as a consultant in China, spent several years at Goldman Sachs. This guy is a phenom, and I, I'm glad that he's here to talk with me across the desk, across the table today here in the Rhino Room. So Matt Bodner, thanks for being on the show today, man. Jason, thanks for having me, man. That was quite an intro. I, <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, there's not many people your age that have as much done in such a short period of time. Like when, when Jason Weiss, who's the, he was a former guest on my show that knows yep. both of us, who said, hey, you've got to know Matt Bodner. It's like, I never heard of the guy. Who is he? And he starts telling me about your accomplishments. But then he says, and this is how old the guy is. So I don't think he said specifically, but he's like, <laughs> he's still young. He's still relatively young. Jason's so, a pretty young guy. Yeah. Well, he and I are the same age. So yeah. thank you for that. Hey, there you go. <laughs> Although my kids are 21 and, and almost 19. His are really young. He just had a baby, not too, well, I guess it's not a baby anymore. So he got a toddler, but, uh, yeah, so thank you, thank you for the, uh, the for that little side side comment there. That's good. No problem. <laughs> so tell me first. Let's talk about your podcast because I love podcasts and people that listen to podcasts like to listen to other podcasts. So what is the Science of Success podcast all about? So the Science of Success, we call it the number one evidence based growth podcast uh, on the internet, and it. I can tell you the story of how we got started and, and the genesis and so forth. But really, it's about finding research, data, science, evidence, and, and trying to interview. I mean, we've interviewed people, everything from neuroscientists to research psychologists, some of the preeminent kind of psychology authors and writers that uh, are out there today. You know, I think at some point the, the, the numbers move around a little bit, but I think we had, it was like seven of the top 10 TED Talk speakers uh, at whatever it was maybe three, four years ago had been on the show. So, you know, people that like that, they give really cool TED Talks and, and those kinds of things. We bring those experts in and we try to figure out, one, what does the science say? What does the data say? What does the research say? And two, 
how do we actually apply that to our lives, right? And so that can be from everything from how do you get better sleep to how do you be more productive to how do you deal with negative emotions, right? How do you cultivate emotional intelligence to things like influence and communication, right? How do you influence other people? How do you get them to ally with you, to help you? How do you negotiate with others? And um, there's a lot of different themes and topics, but really, um, I mean, it's it's been a really cool journey. I mean, we've been doing it for six years at this point, and we've done more than 300 interviews, and we've had everything from FBI hostage negotiators to uh, professional poker players, astronauts, uh, actually multiple different astronauts, all kinds of crazy people on the show. So uh, it's been a lot of fun. That is, that's fascinating. So how do you make connections with those folks to get them on the show? That's very interesting to find that eclectic of a group of people to show up on your show. That's fantastic. I mean, our guest outreach strategy is very much, it's funny, I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily look at it as making connections with them. I would love to form deeper relationships with a lot of the guests, but in many ways, since ours is not an in-person interview show like yours where they're all taking place virtually or the vast majority of them, I think we've had a handful of in-person interviews, the vast majority of them take place virtually. It's a little more, I mean, I'll just give you the inside baseball. It's a little more transactional, right? I mean, typically, and this is how a lot of times we get big name guests is somebody has a new book coming out or a new Netflix special or they just released a product or whatever it is, That's and then they're doing a press junket, you put your name in the hat and hopefully you can get them on your show. Now it helps a lot and, and in our early days of the show especially, we had a very, very thoughtful strategy around leveraging, I don't, are you familiar with Robert Cialdini? Have you ever? Oh yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. So Cialdini's Principles of Influence, right? Um, we were very thoughtful about how do we leverage all of those principles of influence to get someone on the show. So things like social proof and all of those elements, right? Credibility, all of the things that we wanted to use, we stacked as many of them as we possibly could together to get people. So when we pitch a guest, it's really about who else has been on the show, right? Social proof, credibility, it's about the numbers, how many listeners we have, how many downloads, all these different countries. Um, and then it's also about trying to play to their self-interest, right? So, hey, you've got this XYZ thing that just launched, you know, you have a new book coming out, come on the show and we'll promote it to all these people. And by the way, your other peers and people that are similar to you and people you might look up to have also done this. And so that sends a very powerful social signal that, oh, if so-and-so did it, then I should do it too. So there's some science behind getting people on the science of success. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And the, there's a whole machine beyond that too around our, our cold outreach strategy basically that, that fuels that as well. So I, I love the, 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 the title of the podcast a lot. I think that uh, my, my, my curiosity is were you on the science, the brain science and the science of success, was that kind of your thing growing up? Were you a science kind of person or were this is just naturally part of your entrepreneurial endeavors. So the title itself, I actually, when we launched the show, I brainstormed probably 50 titles. And that was not my first pick by a long stretch. Really, we did a bunch of AdWords testing and some some basic campaigns just to see what resonated with people. And that that title happened to resonate the most. So, I mean, my, my preference actually, I forget exactly because there, I mean, I, I had a list of maybe, like I said, maybe 50 of them, but my preference was for something more around, I, I like the art better actually, even though, I mean, I, li I love the science, the data, the research angle, but the show really grew into that from, uh, from a very organic start. We, I didn't even set out to, to create a podcast by any stretch, and it doesn't really align with a lot of the other things I do in my life, which doesn't really make sense. I mean, personally, I benefit from it tremendously just by learning how to deal with fear and deal with negative emotions and how to negotiate better and all of these things, but it doesn't necessarily generate leads for my business or something like that, right? So uh, like a lot of podcasts have a lot more synergy. Mine, just the way that it came about, we didn't really have an approach. It was just happened to be a situation where we I got convinced to create a show, created it, and then it ended up getting a bunch of traction. We just kept doubling down on it. Well, good for you, man. I, I mean, it seems like the podcast angle, so many people today, that, that's what everybody's trying to do. And pulling it off, pulling off a good, interesting, successful show is hard to do. And that's what I'm trying to do with this show. Even though we're relatively new, we're only, I guess, uh, 40 or 50 episodes in. It's, uh, but I'm telling you, man, and I know you can say the same thing, meeting some of the people that I sit across the table with, whether it's on Zoom or in person, 
I'm just, it's like, sometimes I have this pinch myself. I can't believe I'm actually getting to talk to people who've done what they've done. Because in a normal world, yep. most of us wouldn't, most of my guests and I probably wouldn't cross paths. Now, you and I happen to have a connection that when we first were, or tried to get introduced, and, and though this is the first time we've laid eyes on each other, but it had nothing to do with the podcast. We just That's wanted right. to get together because we're both businessmen in Nashville and we wanted to meet. So congratulations for the success on your show. And I would encourage people to go look up the Science of Success podcast. So now let's turn to your entrepreneurial story. So how did you get, like, how did you get started in the entrepreneurial world? What was kind of the genesis of all of this? It sounds like your family has probably had a lot to do with it, but was there something else? So my story really started out uh, when I graduated from college. I, I went, actually the summer before I graduated from college, I went and worked at Goldman Sachs. I did an internship up there in New York. And then that was the summer of 2008, right? So Bam. did the internship, got a job offer, then fall of 2008 happened. I'm a senior in college and thinking, oh, this is awesome, I have a job, et cetera. And then boom, the, the bottom falls out, global financial crisis, and they call me up and they're like, hey, uh, no offer, right? We're rescinding your offer, Nobody, we're not hiring anyone, all this stuff. So I went through my whole senior year without a job, trying to figure out, you know, in an industry that was imploding, how do I get a job in the financial world broadly? And sent my resume to tons of people, tried to follow up, you know, everything from the Federal Reserve to all, you know, small private companies, everything I could to try and get some kind of career. And ultimately, when I graduated in whatever it was, May of 2009, I still didn't have anything in place. And at the time, my dad and my brother were in the restaurant business and they had a couple restaurants. And um, I went and worked for my dad for the summer, essentially, to sort of figure things out. And I lived down in Birmingham, um, where a couple of the restaurants were located. And uh, I had been there for about two months. And I remember I was kind of sitting, I was sitting in this little apartment that I was living in and I was like sitting in the bathroom, like looking at myself in the mirror. And my girlfriend at the time, who actually is now my wife, um, and you know, she was up in New York and I was down in Nashville and I, or I was down in Birmingham, like didn't really have the, you know, any sort of meaningful career trajectory. And I was just like, you know, what am I doing with my life? Like nothing is going right. And then a couple days later, I got a call from Goldman and they were like, Hey, we're hiring again and we want you to come back. So, so this I, is in the spring of 09, right? Yeah. Summer of 09. So summer like, of 09. They called me in, you know, probably been two months. So maybe late June of 09 and the, okay. the training class started in July and it was, they were like, we need you to move up here in like 10 days. So I, I found an apartment sight unseen, rented it, came up, did all the training and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it was great. I mean, I really enjoyed it. It was a tremendous learning experience and, and I did it for a couple years. But the moment that I really meaningfully contemplated entrepreneurship was I was sitting at my desk and I was reading this news story on Bloomberg about um, the founders of Google, right? And, and Larry Page, Sergey Brin. And one of them, I forget which one it was, but one of them at the time was the CEO and his salary was $100,000, right? So I remember I read this sentence and it's Larry Page, again, forgive me, maybe Sergey Brin, but Larry Page, CEO of Google, has a salary of $100,000, comma. And I pause and think to myself as like a 22 year old, you know, Wall Street analyst who thinks I'm the coolest person ever, I was like, man, I get paid more than the CEO of Google. Like <laughs> I am, you know, I'm the man. And then after the comment was like, and he's worth, you know, X like $20 billion in Google stock, right? Or whatever the number was, some insane number. And basically my brain like exploded and I was like, oh, you don't get rich from a salary. You get rich from owning equity in something. And that was just a watershed moment for me and really dovetailed with a, a complete happenstance reading of The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. And both of those things kind of set me on a journey to move back to Nashville and, and become more entrepreneurial. Wow. So... I, I, and so you answered a few of the questions bubbling up in my brain, but I'm going to say some of them out loud. So as an as a Wall Street analyst with Goldman Sachs, you were making more than a hundred thousand dollars. That was what that was kind of yes, like you yeah. were you were making really good money, especially as a 22 year old kid right out of college, living in New York. You're doing really well. Yep. And you're you're thinking you're on top of the world, and you read this story, and you come you made this statement: uh, you don't get rich on salary, you get rich owning equity in something. Yep. So. Is, was that was that really the first time that occurred, or was that the first time it became real to you? I had probably heard it a hundred times before that, but I mean, I feel like that's a lesson that 
even today, a lot of people don't understand. And maybe more so now, I mean, with the rise of entrepreneurship as such a, a cool thing now, right? Everyone wants to do a startup and be an entrepreneur and start a company and all this. So maybe now people get it more so, but I mean, it was definitely something that had, had really not meaningfully occurred to me until that moment. And so now, but you said your dad owned some restaurants, right? Yep. Does, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume with, with fresh technology, fresh capital, fresh holdings, that that has something to, and you got the, the family office, I'm assuming it's not just a couple of mom and pop chicken shops. This, this That's is, right. This is more significant than just a couple of restaurants. Absolutely. So your your family is entrepreneurial, and yeah, but and that, I had but that message didn't like sink in. Like I'm I, I no I, I'm I'm sure it didn't. But I just want to dig into that. So yeah, I mean, I, so I grew up around it, right? I mean, my 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 father was an entrepreneur from the time I was born, basically, and but at the same time, he was gone all the time. He was very busy. He was working super hard and. I didn't really, I, I saw it, but I didn't really download it mentally, like what that meant or what he was doing. And it was always just, oh yeah, he's working, right? I didn't really think <laughs> about like what that was. Um, and I think a lot of people, you don't sometimes see what's in front of you, right? The cobbler's child has no shoes or whatever the, uh, whatever the parable is, right? So I, I, didn't, I didn't fully understand it. Now I have a much greater understanding of it, obviously. Um, but at the time, no, it really didn't sink in for me until I, I think that summer working for him before I went up to, to Goldman helped really shine a light on it because I saw the freedom that he had. I saw his ability to control his schedule and work on the projects that he wanted to and do what he wanted. And then I went to the Fortune 500 corporate grind, big HR department, you know, vacation days and you got to put in your request and your boss has to approve it and all of that stuff. And I, it was very stark difference between those two things, right? And, and if I hadn't had that taste of actually working with him for a couple of months, I don't know that I would have ever seen what that life was really like versus a bigger corporate job. Yeah, so your, your unexpected experience working in your dad's restaurants probably provided perspective that it might have taken another decade for you to get exactly. working in the corporate world. So, yep. well you, so you go to work for Goldman, your mom, dad, family's probably got to be pretty proud of you because coming out of college, going to work for such a prestigious company, uh, and and uh, in the spotlight because of the timing, eight, nine, you know, things are yeah. everything's boy. And Goldman can carry it on when others did not. So you Very you, much, you were yeah. at least with the right firm, right? But uh, so when you had this realization that okay, you don't get rich by the salary, you get rich by holding equity, which is the entrepreneurial spark. How long before you acted on that? Like how long before you exited the corporate world into more of your own thing? It's probably about a year. So I remember it was August of 2010 probably that I read for our work week and I was like, okay. there's more out there. So it was the combination of that realization in that article about Larry Page and Sergey, uh, Sergey Brin and, and reading Tim Ferriss's book, which also I read is a fantastic book. Um, those two things kind of sparked something. Now, when you finally acted on it uh, and you started telling your dad, like, this is what I want to do, was there this moment that dad was like, well, finally you get it? Or was he like surprised or what was so, his response? So I've got, I've got two older siblings. I'm the youngest by a pretty wide margin. They're half siblings. So my sister is basically 20 years older than me. My brother's, I don't even know, 15, 17 years older than me, substantially older than me basically. And so they had both taken very different paths in life. My sister did her own thing. She's very successful, like lives on the West Coast. She's been the CFO of a number of prominent startups and, and done very well for herself. And my brother kind of worked with my dad and helped build up that business together. And so I sort of saw both journeys. And I, you know, I was looking at it. And when I, you know, I basically called my dad and I was like, hey, I'm thinking about doing something more entrepreneurial and he was like he's like hey come you know you should come join me and John Michael my brother and help us build something and grow and do some entrepreneurial stuff with us um, and I was like and I was like okay like you know that sounds really interesting and I and I'd started to after that um, that summer working for him when I would come home for Christmas break or Thanksgiving or whatever I would spend more time around the businesses and sort of see what they were doing right so um, I, I kind of plugged into that a little bit more and I had a better sense for it and I saw some potential and some opportunity. Um, and so when I eventually decided to go do full entrepreneurial stuff, yeah, he was, he was like, he's like, I'm so glad you 
you know, sort of saw that you made the right choice, right, or whatever, basically. But uh, not that there necessarily was a right choice. But he's like, I'm glad you made the same decision that I did, basically. Well, you know, I've 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 got I've got uh, my kids are 21 and almost 19, and um, neither of them have have demonstrated any desire to enter the entrepreneurial world or business ownership. And so, as a dad who's been very successful as an entrepreneur, watching my kids not choose that path, it, it hurt is not the right word, but it's and disappointment also is not the right word. But it's like I'm I'm curious. It's like like you've watched me go from school teacher. Well, before that, I was a pastor, then a school teacher to entrepreneur, and our lives have changed dramatically in in our freedom of time, energy, money, that type of thing, which is what entrepreneurship should bring you. And yet, you're not interested in it. I don't know. Yeah. So your dad probably totally... had those same same thoughts. Like, wait a minute, dude. Like, you've seen what your brother and sister are doing. You see what I'm doing, and you want to go work for Goldman. That's great. You're going to make a lot of money, but you got to ask for time off. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, all right. So you get involved with the family business with you and your dad and your brother. So what was that business? Was it something different than the restaurant business? So no, it was the restaurant business, and and it really started out. So they had a couple different restaurants. They had actually, my dad had been a Wendy's franchisee for a long time, and had built up a number of Wendy's and sold his his Wendy's franchise business, and was had invested one off in a couple other restaurant companies, and was thinking about how do we make this into something bigger? How do we make this into more of a platform, something more concrete, um, and really. Me, my dad, my brother, and we had a couple other partners sort of sat down and said, hey, we want to form an investment platform that can invest in and grow restaurant businesses. And that was the genesis of, of fresh hospitality or fresh holdings. And over time, you know, we built that up to a portfolio today where there's about 15 different operating businesses, so 15 different restaurant brands that some have three or four locations, some have almost 100 locations. Um, that we've scaled up over the last decade or so. And then on top of that, we built an infrastructure of shared services businesses. So companies that do things like marketing, real estate, accounting, technology, um, administration, that we plug those businesses into. So when we invest in a company, we give it some growth capital, but we also give it all of those resources, right? You were talking earlier about um, that marketing agency that sponsored the show, 8Bend, I think is the name of it. Mm -hmm. And it's like having that plus a bunch of other resources when we invest, we plug all those things in. So uh, we set out that vision in the early 2010s essentially and started laying that foundation. And really my charge within that, especially coming from the big kind of financial background was to lead the acquisition effort. So put the deals together, find the companies, acquire them, invest in them and put them into the portfolio. Um, and really doing that and also helping scale up the, sh the shared services infrastructure is where I spent a lot of my time and energy. Well, that's very interesting. So it, how much of what your companies are doing now is actually running the restaurant versus acquisition and then turning over operations to another group? So from an operating standpoint, I mean, we, we're, I would say we're investors and board members. We have operating teams in all of our businesses. And in almost every case, we have a majority equity position in the companies. But we're not, like personally, I'm not an executive in any of the businesses. I have been. I've had to step in and run companies. Uh, I've been the CEO of two different businesses um, that I've fired myself from both cases, right, which I know dovetails with a lot of the stuff you talk about. Um, and I've learned that my skill set isn't in being an operator or being a CEO, right? I mean, I'm capable of doing it and I can, but it's not where I'm thriving. It's not where I'm using my talents to the best of my ability. And so we really, that's one of the big lessons that I learned from, from watching my dad and his successful career trajectory was you have to always replace yourself, right? Always find somebody who can do what you were doing and build a system or a process or a combination of those things that can all come together and help you scale out of what you're doing. And so, uh, I mean, if we, I mean, if we went to Mars for six months, like the companies would all run the same, basically, right? Now, the, the broader holding company investment vehicle might not run the same way, right? Because there's going to be no one hunting for opportunities and putting deals together on a go-forward basis. Um, but the platform, you know, the, the companies within it would all be operating essentially autonomously. You used the phrase I'd never heard before, and I'm going to steal, unless you have a trademark. You said <laughs> scale out. I love that, right? Yep. So everybody's talking about scaling, scale up, you know, making sure the business can get to this next level. But essentially what you just said, scale out, 
is what entrepreneurs really should be doing so that they don't get tied to that business. I totally agree. And I mean, that's, I really like, you know, prep for this interview. And I think when Jason originally introduced us, I've, I've poked around and relatively familiar with your content. And I mean, the whole idea of exiting, you know, instead of selling, just replace yourself, right? I mean, to me, that makes total sense. And uh, I've seen enough times both in just people that I know and even we sold one of our companies out of our portfolio that in hindsight, we probably would have been better off just completely replacing the CEO and keeping. It's really hard to, to replace a valuable, what I'll call a platform company, and I can explain what that is and why I think they're so valuable, but it's really hard to replace a good platform if you sell it. And it's much easier to figure out ways to leverage that platform and scale yourself out of it and create more time and freedom of opportunity and all of that by building a management team or a system, et cetera, uh, than it is to go and start from scratch, right? Because so many people sell their company and then what do you do next, right? Most entrepreneurs might go to the beach for a couple weeks or six months or whatever, but they're not just going to at... 35 or 45 or 55 or whenever, they're not just gonna go to the Caribbean and sip on Mai Tais for the rest of their lives, right? They have the itch, they have the desire, they're gonna be doing something else. And when you're, I'm, I'm also a huge believer and my whole background really, I mean, I've started a number of companies that have been successful and that have failed, but on a go forward basis, I really, I fundamentally believe that buying companies is way, way less risky than starting companies. And I would highly, I can, we can talk all about that too, but I, I'm a big believer that you should much rather buy a business than start one. And yeah. it, the risk is less, and I think it could even cost you less. Well, I am 100% on board with that because I am, I am in the startup now, and I'm like, this is it. This is the last one I'm ever, ever, ever going to do. It, I forgot because I started... I started Energy Lighting Services, which was one my the biggest company to date, which was on the ink list, just like your companies have been on the fastest growing privately held companies in the country. And that was a lot of hard work and a lot of fun. But when I learned and kind of woke up and went, wait a minute, I don't want to do this forever. I don't want to run this. How do I exit? But I don't want to sell it necessarily. Although yep. I will at some point, but I don't, or maybe I won't. I don't know. I mean, I, that's still open. But how do I get out of day to day and still maintain the benefits of owning a business? Okay, so I did that. I was successful at doing that. I've got a great team in place. They run the business. They do fantastic. I still get paid, still have the tax benefits, and I'm able to chase the next passion, which for me, God created me to be a teacher. So now I'm teaching through the podcast, through my consulting and coaching. However, <laughs> that being said, I started like four businesses in the last couple of years, and I'm like, dude, I am done. I will never. I yep. told my wife, I said, babe, I'll never start another company ever, ever, ever. She's like, really? Why? And she, of course, she's not the entrepreneur. She doesn't understand it. Like, the, I will buy one. The next one, and I'm actively looking. Like, I'm actively looking every day. I'm looking at deals. And my wife is like, I don't know why you want to do that. And my assistant, Wendy, who's sitting over here off camera, she's like, are you going to do this? Like, what are you going to do next? <laughs> so I get it, 100%. But why do you think that? Like, I, I went through a decade of starting in an industry that I didn't know anything about without kind of stepping in with help from from a family that was already kind of doing some stuff. It's certainly not diminishing your success, but why do you also believe what I believe, which is starting is harder than buying? What do you what do you what is your perspective on that? Yeah, I mean I've started a number of businesses. Like I said, I've started businesses that have done very well. I've started businesses that have failed and closed and lost hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? And I mean if you have enough investments and, and companies, like you're inevitably gonna have failures. But to me it, it's really a question of of scale and leverage. And I think and when I talk about leverage, I'm not talking about financial leverage necessarily, though that can be a piece, I'm really talking about leveraging your time, right? And so if I'm a very quantitative person, right, coming from Wall Street and all this stuff, like I think in numbers and that's how I approach the world. And if you just run the numbers, right, on a startup versus an acquisition, and I can tell you a half dozen stories of, of how you can get really creative to, to buy things even if you don't have any money and resources or whatever. But if you think about a startup versus buying a company, right? Let's say you want to do a startup, okay? If, if you really want to do it right, right, you're probably going to raise a little bit of money. Now, if you want to just pure bootstrap it, I mean, you're probably going to be like a freelancer or a services company or something, which is a little bit of a whole different game that we can talk about. But if you're going to start a company from scratch, let's say you raise 200, 300 grand, right? From friends, family, whatever. You maybe hire a person or two, right? You've got the, the whole odds of a startup has a one in 10 chance of success or even less than that. And so you're embarking on this journey. You have virtually, you have no customers. You have no revenue. 
you have no employees, maybe one or two people, and you're going and, and hawking a couple hundred grand from friends and family to get it started. Now let's contrast that with buying a company, right? With an SBA loan, right, you could go buy, you say, let's take you, you put together that same $250,000, uh, $300,000, you know, nest egg or savings or whatever to get started. If you do that, you could get an SBA loan, right, where you can put 10% down to buy a company. So that will give you approximately two and a half to almost $3 million of acquisition proceeds. Go buy a business that's doing, I don't know, half a million bucks or maybe let's say even a million dollars or $750,000 of, of profit. You go buy that business for four times earnings, right, which gets you to around that you know, if you buy a million dollar business for, for three times, that's $3 million purchase price. If you buy a half million dollar business for five times, that's a two and a half million dollar purchase price. Now I'm spitting a lot of numbers out. No, but I love it. This is great. Keep so going. <laughs> let's say that, right? So I buy that business. I put in 250 grand. I borrow, you know, two and a half million bucks from the SBA and I suddenly own a company. The debt service is going to get covered by my, my cash flow. And then I've got extra cash flow on top of that. And now I've got a company with $3 million in revenue, right? I've got, I probably have five, 10, 20 employees. I've got an office. I've got anywhere from, you know, five to a hundred, maybe more than that, depending on if you're consumer or business to business customers. I've got all this stuff that you can start playing with. And if you, if you suddenly, you can create a tremendous amount of value by doing that, right? I mean, you can unlock so many different opportunities for acquisitions, for cross-selling, for upselling, for um, you know, bringing on, you have money and resources to bring on, oh, we really need a marketing team. We really need somebody doing paid media. We really need a salesperson, right? Whatever the growth levers are, you have, you have resources that you can now dedicate to that. And your failure rate is, is, is de minimis compared to, I mean, yeah, you could still fail, but like you're much less likely to fail with a business that has $3 million in revenue from day one than you are with a business that has zero in revenue and zero customers and no product market fit. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to do something. I'm going to break my own rule. I'm going to look right back at the camera <laughs> and I'm going to say, Christy, did you hear what the man said? <laughs> That's my wife. We, there you go. We, we were having this conversation like right actively. We went out to dinner last night. We were talking about this and she's not fighting me on it, but she's like, why would you want to buy one? You know what? Cause she's seen me start companies and be successful. Why would you want to? And I'm like, I don't, I don't have the energy anymore. Plus I now understand the leverage. Yep. you just spoke up because it's not just money, although that helps what you just explained with the SBA was fantastic. And I think people should hit rewind and listen to that again, coming from somebody like you, very smart and you know what you're talking about, but not only leveraging the money, but the time and the resources that that company where whatever business is in, if it's a motorcycle business, if it's a clothing business, if they're selling shoes, if they're selling food, they've already got systems and, pr and processes in place, got people in place, they've got vendors in place. Everything's go now, yep. certainly, if you can't improve on that, then you you got to kind of ask yourself, well, why are you doing it? If they're already operating at the top of their game, you know, you're probably just buying another job. You got to be very careful. But I love it. I absolutely love it, Matt. I'm so happy. I'm gonna. I can't wait to play this back and listen to it later. <laughs> well, and, and I think there's there's two really important things too that I want to add to that. One is I use the example of an SBA loan, which we can talk more about that if you want. But but the reality is like that is the worst, in my opinion, the worst case scenario for financing a deal. There's an insane amount of stuff that you can do that's way more creative when you look at pricing or buying companies, right? I mean, things like seller financing and consulting for equity and baseline deals and pipe wrench off. Like there's all kinds of crazy ways you can structure deals where you can buy a company for zero dollars out of pocket and in a lot of cases without having to take on any sort of personal liability or recourse or loans at all. Now you have to be a little bit more of an experienced and savvy deal maker to put some of that stuff together but it's totally possible, right? And so to me, like the worst case scenario is you go get an SBA loan, which is still great. Like there's nothing wrong with that, but you can also improve on that in a number of ways and de-risk yourself even further if you think about it creatively and think about it the right way. Outside of what you guys are doing individually to buy restaurants and service companies that you're doing now, do you go in with another person? For instance, like me said, hey, I wanna buy an X, deal yeah. X dealership, whatever, Absolutely. and you help do the acquisition, is that part of your services? So so I'm a big believer in um, partners, right? And I mean, that that to me is one of the things that helps, that helps anyone have a lot of things going on, right? I mean, you can have multiple different companies and opportunities if you have the right partners. And the flip side of that too is, I look at opportunities all the time where I see an opportunity, but I don't have the expertise in XYZ industry, right? And so to me, Instead of saying, oh, like that's a really interesting staffing business. I know, you know, I don't know anything about staffing. Instead of just saying, well, I guess I'm just gonna have to pass on that deal, 
I would instead ask the question, I, I, one of the most impactful sort of very simple frameworks that's, tra that's really changed my life is, is the, the idea of who, not how, right? So who, not how. Instead of trying to figure out how to do something, just figure out who can help you do it instead, right? And so instead of saying, how do I do that? I just say, who already knows about this industry, right? And go find somebody who's an expert in staffing and say, hey, I want to buy a staffing company. Will you go in on it with me? Right? And suddenly that person can now come and bring, they go, oh yeah, this is a great deal and I have a guy that I worked with at my last company who can come in and be the CEO and I have you know, a relationship with a company that might want to buy us in five years and all of this stuff. And if you're willing to find partners and put yourself and not try to have the whole pie for yourself right, and put yourself out there, you can put all kinds of deals together where you are not just doing it all yourself. Right? And so finding those people who can plug the gaps in your capabilities is a huge way to get deals done way beyond what, uh, what you might be able to do just on your own. Well, that, I, I really, sense. no, it does. I, and I love the who, not how, because I, I believe in that and I believe in the, it's not as much of what you know, but who you know, and then who knows you. Yep. you know, like those things all work together. But, and I know every deal is different. So I'm gonna ask you probably a more technical question that we should get into in the show. And we can, you can dodge it if you want, but like <laughs> every, every deal is so different. So what I'm about to ask is probably not fair, but every deal is different. But if you were gonna do that staffing company, for example, yeah. and I, I don't know staffing, and I'm gonna go buy ABC Staffing. It's uh, for sale for $2 million. They got X number of dollars in revenue, blah, blah, blah. But I don't know staffing. And I went to Bob over here, and Bob's great at staffing, and I wanted to bring Bob. Bob's not an entrepreneur, but he knows staffing. How would you structure a deal with Bob? I mean, if it's just me and Bob, and I'm not talking about any other third parties, I got the money, but yep. I just need expertise. How would you, again, you can dodge it if you want, but how would you structure no, that I'm deal No, I mean, this is, this is the stuff I spend every day thinking about, right? So my, my, one of my expertises is structuring deals, because I've structured, you know, 50 plus transactions, probably maybe even 100 transactions, and not necessarily all acquisitions, but I've structured spin outs and buyouts and, and restructurings and anything you can imagine, right? I've, I've probably done some deal like that. And so, weirdly, the thing that I worked on at Goldman was interest rate derivatives. And I'll bring this back to your question and, and we'll dig into it. But the interest rate derivatives business is very much about the way an interest rate derivative works is you're mapping out the flow of all these different cash flows and interest rates and stuff. And when you put that together, you have all these moving pieces and you get them to all fit together. And that's basically what an interest rate derivative is. So I use that same skill set when I think about deals. And they're just building blocks. They're like Legos that you stack together and you put them together. So if I had a staffing deal that I wanted to do, it depends on, uh, I guess, a couple things, frankly. How much value I think they would add what the deal's capital stack looks like. So how much of my money am I putting in? Do I have third party investors? Am I doing the deal for zero money out of pocket? Because those things will shape how much equity I'm willing to give away. But I would say broadly, somebody that's bringing in industry expertise, I would give them for free probably somewhere between five and 20% of the deal. Um, and maybe, you know, if I gave them less equity, maybe I'd give them some kind of consulting fee or something as a part of that too. You know, when the deal closes, I pay them 25 grand or 50 grand or something like that. Um, but I would give them a, an equity chunk, offer them a board seat, and uh, I would also offer them the ability to invest. And if they were investing, I would go up to maybe like a, a, a more pro rata split or, you know, an equal deal with them or something that they had a bigger piece of the pie. Very interesting. So how, I, I know that you just referred to the fact that you've looked at numbers so long, you, you can look at a deal and kind of figure that out through the numbers, but is it through your education with college, working at Goldman Sachs, that you've learned this stuff that prepared you to be able to put these deals together? Or is there some other way that you learned to be able to do that as quickly and as swiftly as you can do that? I think working at Goldman gave me the ability to think in these abstract frameworks that I kind of plugged together, but really it was just sitting down across the table from dozens of dozens of business owners through fresh through fresh technology fresh capital all the different vehicles that i've used to put deals together and sitting down and saying hey let's figure something out and and one of my um one of the people who's really shaped my thinking about the the, the fancy term for this is m a right mergers and acquisitions one of the people who shaped my thinking about that a lot um, is a guy named Roland Frazier. I don't know if you're familiar with him or not, but, but he's a super sharp dude, uh, kind of a mentor of mine in some sense. And Roland has really shaped my thinking around this whole concept. And he, he says now, he says, I don't negotiate, I only collaborate, right? And that's a really interesting way of thinking about it because 
to me, the most successful deals always come about when you just sit down and try to figure out what are the other person's goals and objectives and needs and how do you put something together that fits that, right? And, how, and, and I look at it almost like a Venn diagram where it's like, here's what I want, here's what you want. Is there enough overlap to put a deal together? And so I've just had a million of those conversations where I sat down with people and I've had a lot of deals that blew up and never came together and you know, didn't pan out, but I've done a lot of deals that worked out and were, were great. And so just doing enough of those, I've figured out like, hey, here's, here's a toolkit of ways to put deals together. And I'm always adding new tools to the belt, right? It's never finished. Um, and I'm always amazed when I see somebody doing a deal and I'm like, wow, like I can't believe they thought of, you know, using that tool to give themselves an extra, you know, piece of the deal or to not have to come out of pocket for that piece of it or whatever, right? There's always some element. Um, but I'm always, I'm always looking for more tools and I feel like every day I'm, I'm, adding new tools, but really just comes from having a lot of conversations with people. So you're in, uh, uh, you were nominated for, or named to Forbes 30 under 30 list. When, when was that? When were the... 2017. So not so. too long ago. So you're yep. still in your thirties. Yep. Still in my thirties. <laughs> I'm not under 30 any longer, but I, uh... Uh, okay. So you're, so you're in your thirties and, uh, you've tremendous success and it's very evident through the way that you've just talked through some of these deal structures you know what you're doing. So this is not fluff. This is not, hey, I just, my dad was great. I'm just working along. You've done this on your own. You've been able to make this. Well, how would you define success? Like you're a successful person from my perspective and probably many, many hundreds of other people that, that are listening to this show right now, this dude's successful. What is your definition of success? That's something I think about a lot and, and having a podcast called The Science of Success, I also get asked that a fair amount and even ask people on the show a fair amount, you know, what, what do they think success is? And to me, success is really two components and I don't, I don't have a flowery definition of it necessarily, but I think one piece is living life on your own terms. So whatever that means, right? The freedom, the finances, all the things that you want, right? And you, that can be being an amazing gardener. It can be being an amazing teacher. It can be being the next Jeff Bezos, right? I mean, it's whatever really resonates with you and, and living life the way you want to live it, right? And if you have the right means and opportunity and you work hard and you have the right mindset, you know, you can, you can, live life on your own terms in any field or endeavor. And then I think the second piece is, um, I, I, there was, I had a guest on the show maybe a month or two ago who had this fantastic definition that, that tied this in. I can't remember it verbatim off the top of my head, but it was basically having the biggest positive impact on the most number of people you can, if that makes sense. And so it's kind of these two elements of living life the way you want to live it, and living life in a way that you have the greatest impact you can on the greatest number of people. Well, with that as your definition of success, do you consider yourself successful? I'm super hard on myself. So, I mean, I think I've had some success, but I really feel like there's a tremendously, like I, I feel like I'm at like, I hate to use it. Well, I don't hate to use it. But like I feel like it's still day one to use the, the Bezos kind of Amazon things. Like I'm just getting started and I really feel like there's so much more I want to do, can do, see as opportunity. And um, every day I just get up and I'm like, how can I capitalize on all of the opportunities that I see and, and execute on them and capture them? And uh, I, I really feel like, you know, there's, I'm, I'm very, very much in like the, the first minute of the first inning. Like I'm just starting. Well, I, I would say that from a lot of people listening to the show and my, uh, I guess, cursory knowledge of you and what you've done before you got on the show, I would consider you to be a very successful person. And I think that your unique expertise and your background has led you to that. And what I'd like to do is just kind of dive into my theory on these five keys of success for Let's kind of the remainder of my show. So what I think, though, is as I talk to entrepreneurs like you, other, other dozens of other people that sat across the table in the microphone, how they achieve success has been a myriad of ways. So how they did it, some bought businesses, some were French and franchises like your dad was in the Wendy's franchise thing, but others start from scratch. Some people took SBA loans, some people, every way imaginable to get where they are. But I think these five keys showed up every time. The first one's passion. And I, and of course, people that listen to the show frequently know that I talk about these five things almost every show. Passion is for me, the number one indicator of success for entrepreneurs and not, it's not in the way that most people think. Most people think passion is just excitement. Like I love shoes, so I'm gonna go in the shoe business. Well, that's fine and that might help you, but you loving that thing doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna be successful. That's There's right. lots of people who've gotten into things that they love 
and they miserably failed at it. I think that passion, because what, what, what I mean when I say passion, because it goes back to the etymology of the word, it means being willing to endure. Passion means willing to endure. So there's an emotional side of passion, then there's a mental. And I think the mental side of passion is the indicator of success. So when you look at your life as a successful entrepreneur and the dozens of other people that you invest with, do you see that too as a key? Or is there, or what's your take on the idea of willing to endure as a indicator or key to success? Yeah, I think that's tremendously, tremendously important. And I, I really like that definition of passion much more than the the shoes example for right that you used a minute ago. To me, that's a much better way of thinking about it. And really, people who I mean, I, I think a big chunk of it is just keep showing up when you get kicked down, right? Because it, it's it's a like my one of my sort of core principles of how I operate is like most things don't work, right? Just for whatever reason, like most of the time when you try something, when you do something, whether it's a new campaign or a new project or whatever, like it just doesn't work most of the time. And if you get discouraged the first time something doesn't work, like you're, you don't even have a, a, a chance of being successful. Like you have to just stick it out and stick it out and stick it out and stick it out and just keep going because it's not gonna work the vast majority of the time and then when it does work, that's when you go, oh, wow, this is actually working. Let's double down on it, right? Let's keep adding fuel to the fire and tinkering with it and getting it, getting it humming. But yeah, I mean, to me, I've just, I've, I mean, just my experience, maybe, I'm, maybe that's just what I've been through. But like my experience is most things are just like do not work uh, from, from the get-go until you have to make them work repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. Yeah, so you use the, you use, I don't know that you use the word, but you talk about keep going, pers being persistent. And that really is what I mean by passion. It's yep. it's willing to endure because you can be persistent but not endure. So yep. I think I think that I every like that. successful entrepreneur that passion, that willingness to push through. Because I've had in my years of success as an entrepreneur, man, I've had to endure some crap. I mean, some some vendor issues, some government issues, some partner issues, some employee issues. Being willing to endure is what led to success. The second the second key to success, Matt, that I find is that people and I'll do the second and third at the same time because they kind of go together. It's the right place, right time, and knowing the right people. And I think that every entrepreneur, Jeff Bezos, uh, Elon Musk, you talk about Tim Ferriss, we've talked about several names, Roland Frazier. If you look at these people, they can point to a spot in time, place in time, and a person and go, that person, that place, that time was one of the keys, not the key, but one of the keys to success. Do you find that to be true in your story? I think that's extremely true. And, and to me, my... My whole life, the, the 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 more time I spend in business broadly, I think that the lesson that who is the most important thing, I who you know, thinking about things in terms of who can help as opposed to how can I do it, is a is a both, it, it's incredibly transformational. And I think the more successful you get, the more important it gets to think in those terms. So to me, those are those are really really critical. And I think the the time and place component is essential too and and that's one that it's taken me a long time to really understand but um I, I had a venture capitalist on the science of success years ago and i asked him this question similar question to that i forget exactly what it was but his answer really stuck with me as a really clean mental image of why time and place is so important and what he said is you can be the greatest surfer on earth but if there's not a wave you can't surf right and so you have to put yourself in a place, in a position where there are waves. And there's a really good book um, that, I'm trying to remember the name of it, it's by a bunch of McKinsey consultants. And uh, it's a, I'm blanking on the name, but it's, all, it's, a, it's a strategy book, it came out a couple years ago, if I think of it, I'll, I'll say. But basically, they did this whole analysis of, of tons and tons of companies, this huge data set, very quantitative. And they came, they came to this conclusion. They said the single most important factor in a company's success, period, is the trend in the industry. That is the single most important factor in a company's success. Huh. Right? Now, there's other factors that are very important, but out of every factor, that was the most important. And so if you're not in a place where your trend, your industry, where things are on the up and up, you know, you're not putting yourself in a position in the right time and place where the wave is coming and you can actually surf it. Because you can be the greatest person on earth, but if there's no opportunity and your industry is dying, you know, maybe there's some consolidation plays or some value, whatever, maybe there's something you could do. But the reality is it's going to be a lot easier to create value in places where things are on the up and up. 
in your place in time, based on what you just said, was that you know you you were coming out of college in the in the crisis, oh eight oh nine, with the track to go to Gold, Goldman Sachs. It was fantastic. You ultimately did, but the place and time had that been two years earlier or two years later. You might not have that epiphany because you had to go work with your dad. You had That's to go right. work in those restaurants. You had to go do and experience that yep. the right place, right time. And then one, if not if not the most important, but one of the most important people that you've mentioned in your story is your dad. I mean, having that opportunity to bring you and say, hey, man, I've got this opportunity. You and your brother and I could work together on this thing. But are there any other people in your life that you can look to and say, man, if that person hadn't been where they were and I wasn't with them at that time, this wouldn't have happened. Is there other people? Like I think there's that? tons, right? I mean, there's there's way too many to even list. I mean, I can give you a couple examples, but I mean, I think it's everybody from business partners to, um, I mean, you know, one of one of my closest business partners when I fired myself of, of as CEO of Fresh Technology, I brought in Sean to run it and he's an all-star. And you know what I mean? He's been amazing. He's been running it for five years. And I mean, without him, you know, I mean, he's, I, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily say he's like a mentor to me, right? But I mean, I think we're partners and we're collaborators and he's been tremendously important person in my life. You know what I mean? From people like Roland Fraser. I mean, I've, I've hung out with him in person many times and I'm a member of his mastermind and all that stuff. But like, I mean, he's not like, we're not like best friends, but he's, he's massively shaped my thinking. You know what I mean? Even people that I've never met or never interacted with. I mean, I'm a huge uh, reader. So I read a lot of biographies and, and things like that. Uh, Charlie Munger, who's Warren Buffett's business partner, was a very influential person in, in shaping a lot of my thinking. Yeah. And so, I mean, there's lots of people that have, I mean, that I've stood on the shoulders of, for lack of a better term. Um, and and I mean, like I said, w both people I know and people I don't know that have been massively impactful. Well, and, and and somebody said I don't know which guest it was on my show, but they talked about indirect mentors, and they talked about how reading books, uh, watching YouTube videos, listening to podcasts like this that they get mentorship indirectly through people. And I, I think that your point, Matt, was really good because there's so many people that you don't even know personally that have been those right people for you to get where you are. And, and honestly, like this conversation that you and I are having today is gonna send my life in a di different trajectory just because of you sharing your story. And I think people listening to this this episode, they're gonna, they're gonna, they probably will never look back and say, Jason Duncan and Matt Bodner were, was that person. <laughs> but we are influencing them, and that's why it's so important to do shows like this and to listen to shows yep. and to listen to your show. I think getting that indirect mentorship, you never who know who that right person is gonna be or when it's gonna happen. Now, the final two Ps, so it's passion, place, people. The final two are preparation and plan. And so your preparation, I can, I, can, I can see it in your story. I don't know if you think about it this way, but so where did you go to school? University of Richmond in Virginia. So, okay, so you went to University of Richmond, you had this opportunity, learn finance, you're gonna go to Goldman Sachs. So that prepared you, even though it wasn't your ultimate goal, prepared you to be ready to see, like you described earlier, how you can see the capital stacks and how the partnerships work together that was part of your preparation. At least that's the way I see it. Is there something different that you see as part of your preparation for success? No, I mean, I think I, I view everything as a, a learning opportunity that's kind of building skills for whatever I'm gonna do next. You know what I mean? And so even if it's a failure, even if it doesn't work out, I'm just trying to get reps in and trying to get as many reps as I can, doing deals and putting transactions together and working on things that I wanna work on because I know that every single rep is gonna make me better for the next rep, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so I, I definitely think that those things were instrumental, uh, but I think that it's an ongoing process that I'm always trying to prepare, I'm always trying to improve, I'm always trying to get more reps of whatever I'm doing so that I can so that I can be better the next time around. The, the final P I think is right up your alley, and, and I call it plan, but actually if I wasn't trying to be alliterative, passion, place, people, preparation, plan. I would call it finances, <laughs> but, <laughs> but F doesn't fit with all the P's. So I had to come up, well, how, how do I put finances in, in my five P's of success? And what I came up with was plan because I look at every successful entrepreneur had a plan to find and deploy the financial resources required to be successful. And I think this is right up your alley because this is what you do every day. You are the planner. Even though you don't use that word, you're, you're that strategizer that figures out, okay, SBA loan is a good option, but not certainly the best or even among the top four or five options because there's family office money, there's hard money, there's, there's leverage uh, of yep. money without you having to come out of pocket at all. So 
I would assume you would agree that one of the keys to success for entrepreneurs is that ability to find and deploy capital, but I don't want to assume too much. So what do you think about that? No, I think that's it's absolutely essential, right? And 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 to me, I, I even zooming out a little more broadly on the definition of planning, I think that a lot of people, even just sitting down and figuring out what are your goals, right? I mean, I, from the science of success community, I mean, we have thousands of listeners all around the globe and like... I get emails from people all the time and I've, I've done live intensives for listeners and stuff that it's amazing to see just people don't have basic clarity about what they want to achieve, right? And, and even that's like step one, right? If you just have goals, you're ahead of a shockingly large portion of the population. Then from there, the next major shift is aligning your time with your goals, which is another thing that like blows people's minds. But it's like if you've said something's really important and you want to do it, are you actually spending time on it, right? Are you actually doing it on a regular basis? Or do you, is, does it exist in your calendar? Or is it just a thing that you are wishing to happen someday, right? And there's a really fun exercise that you can go through where you basically take, start out with your lifetime goals and you break them down into five-year goals. And, or you, sorry, you go lifetime, 20-year, five-year, three-year, one-year, right? And, and you can blend those if you want or whatever. But the idea is basically you start to see, okay, well, if I want to do this in my lifetime, and okay, yeah, in 20 years, yeah, I'll be doing X and Y, and right? But then when you start getting to like five and one, you start to see, okay, well, what I'm doing isn't really putting me on the path to being where I want to be. So what needs to change, right? And if you don't change anything, then you're not going to get to the path you want to get to. So to me, all of those elements of planning and the, the financial piece, I think, is instrumental too, right? I mean, figuring out, I mean, like I said, I'm very numbers driven. So how do you deploy capital? How do you look at opportunities, return on investment, risk? I mean, I'm, I'm a very avid poker player and I've played in the World Series of Poker for the last four or five years, X 2019 or whatever, or 2020 because of COVID. Um, but big poker player and I mean poker teaches you how to think about risk quantitatively because you basically see you can say okay I'm gonna bet X and I know that I'm making the right choice but even if I'm making the right choice I may not win every time right and that's part of life that's part of poker and so um, I, I think having the having both sort of financial literacy and also having a thoughtful approach to your goals both of those things are really 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 important to being successful you use the phrase financial literacy, and I believe that so many entrepreneurs are financially illiterate. It's crazy. It is, it is insane, and I was one of those people. I, I think it was really, if, I, if I'm totally transparent and honest with myself and the listeners, is that my financial literacy didn't begin until just a couple of years ago. Like, it's been short, and I started my first big company back in 2010. I didn't know crap about financial literacy. I didn't know anything. I, I just knew what I'd heard on Dave Ramsey saying, don't take out debt, that's cut right. up your credit card. That was yep. all I knew, man. Do a budget. Well, okay, well, that, that's fine, but that is not the way money works. Money does not work that way. So why do you think that it is that so many people are financially illiterate? Well, we don't teach it. That's for starters, right? I mean, maybe you get like a, a half day seminar or something, but I mean, we don't teach people really any of the basics of financial literacy in school, um, which is a whole broader topic that we could probably is beyond unpacking in this conversation, but we don't really teach people those fundamentals. And I also think, I mean, a lot of, I mean, certainly some people it aligns with their skill sets, um, but I think a lot of people it just doesn't fit, especially if you're really creative and, and, and some, you know, in some sense, um, the entrepreneurial drive doesn't necessarily always line up with somebody who's really quantitative and analytical because uh, sometimes those types of people overthink things and don't take a lot of risk and, and have a different approach. Uh, I think it's such a shame that the financial literacy, and I, 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 you're part of what I do as a coach when I'm sitting down with clients is going through, and I, I know I have this kind of this debt talk that I do that a mentor of mine gave me when I start talking about debt and how debt really works and how money works. Every single time I give it, and these are to entrepreneurs. These are not just to some dude off the street. It's entrepreneurs, and they look at me like I've got three heads. They're like, "Are you kidding me? That's what debt. That's how debt really. Yes, that's how it really works." Yep. Holy crap! I had no idea because they'll think about, "Well, I need to hire." I'll give you an example. I need to hire a salesperson, right? I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a single shingle. I need to hire a salesperson, but that salesperson is going to cost me fifty, sixty, or, or whatever. 50, yep. Let's call it fifty thousand dollars a year. I don't have fifty thousand dollars. Okay, well, let's go figure out where to borrow. Oh man, I don't. Know. Well, that's going to cost me X ten uh, percent yeah. in interest. Well, okay, it's only ten percent of the money that's out at any given time. And you're not pulling all fifty and hand it to your employee. You're going to pay him four thousand dollars a month, four thousand eighty three dollars. If I do it in my math, or whatever that is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You're, you're you're okay. So that first month that cost you four hundred bucks, like 
you only have four hundred dollars of money out to hire this person to go create revenue for you. And when I and this was a, of course a very overly simplified version of that debt talk, but every time I give that Matt, people are blown away. I, as I was the first time I heard it because I thought debt's bad. Don't do debt. Don't do that's debt. right. And I'm like holy crap. A lot dude, of people it works. That. Leverage is the, is the thing that makes the world grow. Well, it's funny too because I mean, for whatever reason, I'm you know I'm I'm very numbers driven and like I, I went to uh, a friend of mine. I don't know if Jonathan Harris. I don't know if you know him, but he would be a good guest for the show actually. But um, he uh, he invited me to Business Mastery, and so I went to Tony Robbins Business Mastery with him, and uh, there was like a whole day on basically what I would call like not accounting 101 would be like too generous, right? It was like just really, really basic financial accounting stuff, right? Like how to read an income statement. And I was literally like, what is this? This is a, this is a colossal waste of time. And everyone in the audience was like, this is life changing. And I was, <laughs> I, I, it like blew my mind. Cause I was like, wow, I guess this is something that, you know how you don't know, like it's hard to see what you're good at because it just, you think, oh yeah, everybody knows how to do that. Right. So that was something that I learned was like, okay, wow, that's actually a skill set that I have. Like I can think in leverage and numbers and like when I, you know, when somebody shows me a company or a deal or an opportunity, like the, I throw out like everything except like the numbers and I just look at that and then if that makes sense, then I'll go back and like look at, okay, what are the broader, you know, what's the narrative piece? But like to me, it's all, it all hangs on the structure of the financial piece and that to me is just, the, that that is, I mean, Warren Buffett called it the language of business, right? So to me, it's really, really essential and it's crazy how, how how much financial literacy there is. I oh, know it's, 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 it's crazy, it's sad, um, but that means that people like you and I have job security. There's That's right. things for us exactly to go right. do. You can do M&A work, I can coach, like there's, there's work to be done. And by the way, I think I have a deal I need you to look at. <laughs> Happy to help. <laughs> well, so we've got uh, entrepreneurs that listen to the show that are wildly successful, and we've got entrepreneurs that haven't started yet. They're future entrepreneurs, they haven't started yet. And we got everybody in between. I want you to talk to the future entrepreneur right now, because you're in your early 30s, you're killing it, you're doing great, you're you're maximizing money and leverage and time and deals. What do you say to that person? He he or she, she is sitting there in their car listening, sitting in traffic, driving home, driving to work in the morning, they're riding their riding their bicycle, walking their dog, but they're out there listening right now. They have they're a future entrepreneur, they haven't started. What would be your advice for that person? There's a couple of pieces of advice that I would give them. I think one would be don't overthink it and just get started, right? So many people spend all this time waiting for the perfect idea, the perfect opportunity, and, and even waiting to be motivated to do something. I think that's the completely wrong approach. Instead, you should just start and then keep figuring things out. And uh, that could be something as simple as a side hustle or whatever. I think there's a lot of merit to if you're really interested in starting a company, which again, I would recommend buying one, which will be my next piece of advice to that entrepreneur. But if you're really interested in starting a company, I think the worst approach is to just quit your job, go all in and like start it with no safety net. And some people advocate that as advice and I understand the reasoning why they do. But I think the opposite approach of start a side hustle because the reality is your first side hustle is probably gonna fail and your second one's probably gonna fail and your third one's probably gonna fail. And I, I, I mean, I've had a million failed side projects and all kinds of stuff before the science of success happened that were all parts and iterations and things that the science of success wouldn't have been successful if it weren't for those other things. But to me, Knowing that failure is a part of it and just w and just getting started and not getting discouraged when things don't work is really, really important. So that would be my first piece of advice. And my second piece of advice would be if you really want to start a business, buy one instead using what we talked about earlier. <laughs> well, I'm with you on that. And I, I'm 100% in your camp, especially as one who's had so many startups under his belt and I'm done. I'm tired. It's, it's good. It's rewarding. But like I'd be so much better if I just went and bought one that's already working. So um, what? how could people get in touch with you? They, I know they're impressed. I know they're listening. Obviously, they can go listen to the Science of Success podcast, which you probably picked up a bunch of, well, maybe two or three listeners <laughs> out, of my, out of my less than 5 million downloads. <laughs> but you, you're you going to pick up some listeners there. But how else could people get in touch with you, man? Yeah, I mean, so my, my email is jmb. So jmb. It's my name, James Matthew Bodner. Go by my middle name. It's another long story. But um, at mattbodner.com. So you can just email me. I answer all those emails. Uh, if you have a deal you need help with or you want my advice or whatever, just shoot me an email and, uh, and I get back to everybody. And Bodner is B-O-D-N-A-R. A-R. Yeah, so that's a key. Make sure that everybody spells it right. Well, Matt, it's such an honor to meet you. After all this time, we got introduced so long ago, we finally sit down across 
the couch here from each other and talk. I'm impressed. Uh, I knew I would be, but I'm more impressed than I thought I would have been. Like, I don't know what my expectations were other than I needed to meet you. And so it's been an honor to have you on the show. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Thank you for sharing your story. And I know that it's going to help people listening to get better and to be better and to get started, not overthink it. So thank you. Well, Jason, thank you so much for having me on the show. This is a really cool spot to do it. Uh, and I'm so glad we connected in person. And I can't wait to uh, further our relationship. Well, there you have it. So every single time we talk with somebody on the root of all success, we pick up these little nuggets of advice about how to be successful. And this guy, Matt Bodner, actually has a podcast that talks about the science of success, where mine's more anecdotal, where I've interviewed all these people and I came up with these five things of passion, place, people, preparation, and plan. His show, if you want to go listen to it, the, the Science of Success podcast, he's going to dive into the neuroscience and how scientifically People can be successful at whatever endeavor, not just entrepreneurial, but whatever endeavor. So go check that out. And again, I know that <clears throat> I know that you listen to this show to get those, those little nuggets of information. But one of the things I want to make sure that you understand is that part of what I do, now that I've, I've exited one of the big businesses that I started a long time ago, is I'm teaching, using my gifts of teaching and leadership to help you get the results you want, which I think... If I'm right, if I'm reading this right, as an entrepreneur, you want the freedom that Matt and I talked about. You don't want to be tied down to that business 50, 60, 70 hours a week. You want to go do that next big thing, whether it's buying another business or, or traveling the world or whatever it is you want to do. You've got to get out of the day-to-day -day operations. You've got to scale out. You've got to figure out how to get out of the way. You've got to make sure that you aren't the leverage point in, or the linchpin in the middle of that business that other people are running that. And that's what Matt talked about on the show. That's what I do every day. And if you want to be a part of something I call the Exit Accelerator Group Coaching Cohort, I've got one starting very soon. We meet on Thursdays. It's 12 entrepreneurs for 12 weeks, live coaching with me, one hour by Zoom, eight times over those 12 weeks. And I take you through the four steps that I used to exit the daily operations of one of my businesses and how I use that information, not only to exit a business that was already going, but how to start other businesses that I never entered. <laughs> so, so exit without exiting is not just for people that are looking to sell it. That's not what this is about. It's like, how do you structure your business where you embrace delegation, you eliminate stress, you establish processes and systems, you invest in people. I will show you exactly how to do that. Give me 24 hours and I will change your life. It's eight one hour sessions and about two hours worth of homework between sessions. And it will absolutely change your life. Go to exitwithoutexiting.com. Check it out. Join my next cohort. And I will tell you this, if you'll go to Instagram or LinkedIn and send me a direct message and say that you heard me on this show talking about giving you a discount, I'll give you a discount coupon code that you can use to apply when you go to checkout. So go to exitwithoutexiting.com, check it out, and I hope that'll help you out. So tune in next time here on The Root of All Success when we talk with yet another amazingly successful entrepreneur just like Matt about his or her story of success, how they achieved it, and just, I'm going to see if those five keys keep unlocking it because if it unlocked it for him, it can unlock it for you too. I'm the real Jason Duncan. I'll see you next time. Remember, Jesus is King. Thank you for listening to another edition of The Root of All Success with the real Jason Duncan. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, we invite you to visit therootofallsuccess.com to access the show notes and other helpful resources. Take charge of your business. Grow it from great to incredible. Join us again next time here on The Root of All Success.